cities have been made by men for men. If you look around, it's clear men have planned out most of Paris. That's according to these two urban designers. Moi, en tant que femme qui fait pas de basket, <laughs> je me dis simplement que cet espace ne m'appartient pas. En fait, c'est ces hommes qui sont là dans l'espace public en train de se distraire. Je cherche où est le pendant féminin. Que font les femmes pour se distraire pendant ce temps? Elsa and Jerome are part of a new generation of urban designers. Their job goes beyond city planning. It's about making public spaces not just functional, but livable for everyone. Size, sex and age, they all affect how we interact with the landscape. So it makes sense if women and men design our urban areas. But in the workplace, Elsa's outnumbered. Il y a des a priori comme quoi les, les filles ne peuvent pas avoir la même force que les garçons euh, et que physiquement, bah, il y en a, on préfère prendre un homme plutôt qu'une femme pour du travail manuel. Et en fin de compte, ces travaux des fois manuels sont aussi une porte d'entrée euh, à des travaux de conception. The number of male and female urban designers in France is unknown. It's a new profession, so the tax system doesn't recognize it yet. But only 25% of French architects are female, and their male colleagues earn on average 23,000 euros more each year. Urban designer Carola Muhan thinks men land the best paid jobs because they tend to go for flashy, standout projects, which make them well known. We're at the Parc de la Villette on Paris's northeast edge. In the 1980s, the architect Bernard Schumi turned a disused animal slaughterhouse into a modern park. It was one of former President François Mitterrand's grand projects. I do think this is a male type of design. Uh, the big concept is the thing in general for ma male designers. And this is why women are perhaps less visible. Corona believes women are particularly good at making discrete creations, which improve our everyday experiences of cities, like her luminous, interconnected, cocoon-like park bench called Luciole. She wants to install several Lucioles here, an uninviting park that's little more than a through route. I think Luciole is feminine basically because it's focused on ambience. I was thinking of how could I make a, a, a place feel safer, feel nicer. And yeah, this is, this is not about a big gesture that, you know, will stand out. This is just a soft touch. Luciole was on show at the design forum Lyon Urban City earlier this year. The event's organizer, Olivia Queer, has come to this luxury trade fair for inspiration. Her job is to handpick talented urban designers for her forum, and she's found more women than ever are applying to take part. Plus on va parler effectivement de plus de design urbain, plus la femme aura sa place parce que j'ai l'impression que cette femme, cette part finalement des émotionnels dans la ville, les femmes, alors ça c'est vraiment mon regard aujourd'hui, sont plus sensibles à ces questions-là. With more room opening up for female urban designers, cities should start becoming more livable for everyone. And that report by Claire Williams. Now, in numerous parts of the world, architectural schools are full of female students. But, as is the case in many professions, the figure starts to drop off once women enter the workplace. Joining me now from London is Rachel Fisher, one of the founding members of Urbanistas, a female architectural and urban planning group. Rachel, thanks for joining us. Now, how would cities look if there were more women architects and urban designers? I think that's a really interesting question. I think what you have to think about is what design is actually for, what architecture is actually for. It's about improving the user experience. So if we think that basically most people who are designing our cities, designing our places are men, then it's it would be interesting to kind of think about what, what it would look like if women designed it. And I think quite a lot of that will be about kind of improving just everyday tiny interactions. I think as the, as the piece that you were, um, that we just had before was talking about, that actually the, the smaller interactions are the things that women tend to kind of notice and experience more, um, whether that's because you're out with um, children or whether that's because you're actually out walking, you're kind of going from place to place in a, in a slightly different way than men would do, sort of a, perhaps a less kind of fully directed way. 
So, Rachel, tell me what buildings in particular lack by being designed and built by predominantly men. Well, I think there's the obvious kind of, you know, how many toilets do you have for women versus how many toilets do you have for men? Um, but also, I think that there's another question as well about what kind of spaces you're designing within the building. So whether that's the home or whether that's the office space, uh, women will use a space differently. They'll use it potentially at different times of day. But I think the really important point actually about having more women designing buildings, designing cities is actually about making places better for everyone. It's about how do we design places irrespective of what gender the designer is, irrespective of you know what ethnicity the designer is, what is it actually that we're trying, who are we designing for? You should always start from the user whenever you're doing design. So if women are, you know, 51% of the population, then we need to be designing for them. But we also need to be designing more inclusively generally. So we need to be designing for people who are, you know, disabled. We need to be designing for people who um, have different uh, kind of needs generally. Um, so it's not just about kind of what buildings lack because they're designed by men. It's about what they could gain actually by being designed by a wider diversity of people. Why are there so few prominent female architects such as Zaha Hadid? Well, I think the answer to that is obviously a really complex one. It takes ages to train to be an architect in the first place. So by the time you've actually got to be um, a fully qualified architect, a lot of women have actually been kind of whittled out of the profession. They tend to drop out quite early, uh, we know, um, in, terms of in terms of just the way that um, architectural practices operate. Um, they're not very human-friendly offices, by and large. I'm, I'm not an architect, but I, I know quite a few women architects through my Urbanistas network. And all of them have really made a lot of comments about how difficult it is, actually, to combine a work-life balance within the architectural profession. And that's something that affects not just women, but absolutely everybody. It's just that women, by and large, tend to drop out early because, because they do tend to have other caring responsibilities. So what needs to be done to encourage more women to stay in the profession? I think we need to look at the way that the profession operates. I think we need to look at the way in which um, qualifications happen. I think we need to look at the way in which kind of architectural practices are run because the way that architectural practices currently work is that you basically work all the hours that God sends um, because you're looking to kind of get a project in at a good cost um, and a good, you know, and have a good relationship with your client and all these sorts of things and clients will want you to do um, kind of the impossible in as short amount of time as possible. And we really need to look at um, the way men work and we really need to kind of look at the way men work at home as well so that you have more sharing between kind of home and work between both genders better kind of equality on on both those levels and uh, are you finding that you know your uh, group is gaining uh, popularity not just in the uk but elsewhere around the world yeah, it is. We actually have a chapter um, in Sydney, Australia, which was started up by the friend of an urbanista in London. So um, we now have chapters all across uh, the UK, but increasingly um, we've had interest, as I said, in, in Sydney, Australia, but also um, in America as well and Canada. There, there are urbanistas kind of hiding everywhere. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's something that what we set up urbanist is really to, to challenge the way that urban design and urbanism generally actually gets done and to challenge the way that we think about cities and the way that we think about um, kind of urban change, urban governance. Um, and so it's a really broad spectrum of kind of feisty women um, wanting to kind of basically change the world. Um, and, and that has resonance, I think, all over the world. Rachel Fisher, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, the number of French women in construction has almost tripled in the last decade. While few are involved in manual labour, many of those have taken up on-site jobs such as engineering, management and planning. Businesses have been actively encouraging women to join the sector. Mark Thompson and Aminati Yade met one such new recruit. Bertie's day starts bright and early at 7am. She's normally among the first on site. As project manager, it's important for her to be on top of every detail. Today, she's helping to build a new path for pedestrians in the outskirts of Paris. How's it going, Christian? Shall we do a tour? She graduated from the prestigious ESTP University in 2012 and quickly got a job at civil engineering firm Colas. Bertie is among the 10% of women working in the construction industry who operate on site. Our generation starting to get interested in learning trades over the last few years, things that were considered jobs for men. Around 20% of Bertie's fellow new recruits are also women. She believes the industry has turned a corner. 
I don't think there are any barriers, so we shouldn't hesitate to get into this line of work. Betty could be in line to have even more female colleagues in the future. The number of women choosing a career in construction has risen exponentially since 2005. These days, it's not a job which obviously appeals to women. We have to learn how to communicate and anticipate their needs more in order to hire younger people and really sell it to them. Dozens of different trades are needed on a construction site, but there's often a lack of information for young women looking to find a route in. Bertie is among those to have carved out a career for herself. She's convinced it can provide good opportunities for other women too.